Facebook's a go. YouTube's a go. All right. We're live on everything. Yeah, you ready, Grambo? Yeah, let's do it. All right, all the way from New Zealand, we've got Jeremy Cloak with us. He's uh, He's been a music teacher and a sound engineer, makes uh, musical instruments, and he's he's been in the CE5. Uh, and now, I'm going to need your help pronouncing this, Jeremy, but Atur Aturea? Yeah, Aotearoa. So Aotearoa, that's the yeah. Te, Reo, Te Reo Māori, uh, the, the official name for New Zealand prior to Abel Tasman uh, <laughs> naming it after the city in Holland. So, yeah, it's known as Aotearoa officially, according to many. Nice. I had a hard time pronouncing that. I read the Celia's book. I narrated Celia's uh, handbook, right. handbook, and I right. it took me like twenty tries to get that. I just couldn't do it. <laughs> yeah, well, it, it translates loosely into English as as the land of the long white cloud. So the Polynesian voyages, uh, seeing the clouds on the horizon, and then knowing that there was land there. So, oh, nice. Yeah. Huh. So when when was that? Like is that a lo is that a long time ago? Supposedly, yeah. Well, there, there, there's different, there's different uh, Theory, lineages here. Yeah. yeah. So Kupe uh, is is the main um, acknowledged as the as the main uh, kind of explorer of Aotearoa coming from Tahiti originally, and he arranged the, the main migration. So that that happened from Tahiti and Rarotonga and so forth, uh, and they they landed in the Bay of Plenty area. There are other um, lineages, so uh, through my paternal line, through my father's side, uh, we had the lineage of Rakai Hautu, uh, who's one of my ancestors uh, in the Waitaha tradition. So the, the, in our lineage, we have uh, the Waka Uruau, which was a double-hulled voyaging waka that Rakai Hautu led through um, to Moana Nui Akiwa, the, the whole of the Pacific Ocean, and uh, our Whakapapa, our, our genealogy says that he arrived uh, around about 1200 AD. Oh, wow. So this was this was prior to to that. So yeah, it depends what lineage you follow. Uh, the you know the the Pacific was was uh, basically a highway of of activity then. You know, Polynesian voyages are by far the most advanced in terms of celestial navigation and awareness of of uh, ocean patterns and movement and voyaging. Uh, when you look at the Pacific Ocean and you think, well, these people traversed from, they were in Hawaii, then they traversed all the way down, let's say, to Tahiti, to Rarotonga, and you look at the huge expanse of, of ocean and then these tiny dots, this is very, very precise navigation. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. So, well, that yeah, was, that was a, at that time when there was, I mean, we talked to Randall Carlson a lot here, and he talks about that time being a time of building, like around the 1100s, 1200s, where there was stuff going on all over the world. There was the, yeah. cath the cathedral building and the South America stuff, and even in North America, the, the Chacoan culture building their things on mountains. I mean, a lot of, a lot of travel and a lot of uh, building, probably after the Dark yeah. Ages, I guess. Yeah, yeah, I, I assume so. Um, I mean, we have a... Um, there's, there's a lot here in terms of um, what's being uncovered as well, uh, and there's various schools of thought on that. I think that, you know, the reality of, of history, you know, when I, was, when I was a kid and I was brought up at school, I was taught that, you know, Māori came and they killed the Moriori, who was said to be their, Te Haku Oni Oni, or the, or the first indigenous people of Aotearoa. And that, that's just a total fallacy, according to someone else's version, which is far more accurate. And then you get, um, so it, I, I like to kind of highlight that because, you know, his story literally is the popular story at the time. Yeah. And at the time, it was very much the, the colonial version that was pushed through schools. And now with um, some prominent New Zealand historians coming to the front and actually engaging more fully with Māori and looking at the bigger picture of what was going on in those time frames, you're getting a more accurate representation now, which is more balanced and more fair from both sides rather than just, you know, this is what happened. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, and that's happening everywhere. I mean, all the, a, lot, a lot of the stuff we learned in school is just yeah. not really 
turning out to be the case. Everything yeah. eventually. <laughs> the stuff that you learned in school that's going to stand the test of time is to, like, be kind and treat others how you want to be treated. And that's, I mean, they should have spent more time on that. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. It brings to mind that um, we have a, a tradition here of, of pepeha and uh, what's called uh, like a type of Maori proverb. And one I have here in front of me, it, it says, Waiho iti toipoto kaua iti toiroa, which means let us keep close together, not far apart. And I think that's really quite relevant with what's going on on our planet right now because time after time you look at, you know, when, when, when there's a challenge for us as a species, what happens? Division comes in yeah. and then things fall apart and then we have to reassemble again. And, and this one's a major one right now, the phase we're in right now. And we have, a, we have a remarkable opportunity to unify and to move through this phase and actually get on with really being a human, you know what I mean? And in that, in that sense of being kind, of being unified, of uplifting each other and supporting each other, you know, that's, that's really where we're at, I believe. How do people make use of that opportunity without, because uh, <clears throat> that's the big question right now is how, what do you do, right? If you, if you kind of want to bring back the people and the love and all that and, and try and resist this, uh, yeah. it's kind of this. I don't know. It just yeah. I feel like we're on this precipice now. Of we're either going to be completely Definitely. tracked globally and all that, or, or we're going to be sort of getting back towards nature. Like there's almost a choice yeah. we have to make. Well, you know, science has been warning us for years that the way that we're living is totally unsustainable. And, you know, the majority of, of humans have had their head in the sand, especially in the, in the political, the geopolitical arena. You know, there is, there is nothing significant that has changed since, you know, since 1899 when Tesla had, had you know, limitless energy. And J.P. Morgan Chase and, and um, Edison came along and privatized it, you know. So that was, as Dr. Greer says, this, this last 120 years, what have we been doing? So people often end up feeling powerless and um, kind of get into a, a bit of despair. And for me personally, until I came across CE5, you know, I... I came from a bit of an activist background as well. I would be up in trees preventing them from being chopped down and protesting on the streets for logging of pristine rainforests here in New Zealand. And, you know, I went through quite a depression uh, for many years because I did feel very, very helpless. I was, you know, in a state of anguish with the world just kind of going, oh, come on, when are we going to graduate, <laughs> you know? As um, Michio Kaku says, you know, when are we going to become a type zero or a type one civilization and live in peace? And um, the, the thing that's kind of coming to the front at the moment with this whole stay home um, policy or enforcement, if you call it, I, I've been calling it a rahui, which is like a retreat. So stay at home and go internal is people have been using Zoom, of course, and doing what we're doing now and reaching out and non-locally, which, you know, helps us engage our consciousness. And if I, if I was to quote um, Paramahansa Yogananda for a second, I have one of his um, quotes here uh, in front of me. The one thing that will help to eliminate world suffering more than money houses or any other material aid is to meditate and transmit to others the divine consciousness of God that we feel. So, you know, not in the sense of the the all-knowing religious god but the god if you if you look at consciousness as this omnipresent field of oneness so there's there's numerous people that are getting together doing um, mass meditations doing ce5 online and kind of getting into the state where we're connecting more deeply with each other um, beyond the non-physical which is is really uh, central to the whole ce5 practice and what i believe to be um, very imperative right now that we kind of start energetically aligning and letting go of this division and, and actually greeting each other without this spacesuit. You know what I mean? Yeah. So th yeah. this is this is not me. You know, we're looking at each other, but we're, we're living in this 3D reality, 3D reality, but this is not who I am. It's not who you are. It's not who any of us are. So we get the opportunity to explore this. And when we understand that, you know, beyond our religious differences, beyond our beliefs, beyond, for some people, the color of our skin, what we have is this resonating energy within our body. And when we meet each other there, the illusion dissolves. And the fussing and the fighting is, is well, what were we doing? Sorry. 
Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. So it, it, it's kind of this phase is really, for me, is really a, 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 a remarkable opportunity for us to, to engage in that and, and get the lesson that we're creating for ourselves, essentially. Yeah, I was hoping there was going to be some unintended consequences, like positive ones for this for this lockdown yeah. and people maybe connecting a little bit and finding out what's yeah. what's more uh, meaningful to them at a deeper level. Yeah. There's the term apocalyptimist, you know. Yeah. <laughs> It's, you know, apocalypse and optimism. So the, the person who who can see that it's all falling apart, but that believes it's going to be okay. Yeah. You know? So I like that term. So what's, uh, what, brought, what got you interested in the, the CE5 and, and the, what about your background in terms of that kind of ET contact thing? Yeah, well, well it's, it's interesting in hindsight with what I've learned you know, in the last, especially in the last kind of 10 years, uh, there's various phases of my life, but the, the, the first experience really I had was, was when I was four years old, and uh, it's still very vivid to this day. Uh, I was asleep in bed, and I had a, a chest of drawers that was quite close to me. I was facing the opposite way, and I got this, I felt this physical tap on my shoulder, and I rolled over, and I saw this big feline face right there. And it scared the hell out of me. You know, I was four years old. So we <laughs> went running into my mother's room, crying and, and you know, totally distraught, you know. <laughs> and uh, around that, that same time, I also had uh, like a golden golden light that appeared in my room um, and, and kind of like a humanoid form. It was kind of semi-phasing in and out, kind of like what my hand's doing now, you know, on the screen. And um, so th those were the earliest experiences um, that I had throughout my my teen years, I saw all sorts of anomalous uh, things because I I was often out in you know rural areas in New Zealand or out in the forest. Uh, so you know this ranges from lights in the sky to lights in the forest and strange movements, um, strange sounds in the environment. And and at that time, I was also um, experiencing a lot of sleep paralysis, which also scared me because I didn't understand it then, you know. So a, a lot of people report, you know, sleep paralysis where you're kind of in this phase shift between awake and asleep, kind of suspended. Uh, that was happening a lot. I was having a lot of uh, lucid dreams that involved ETs. Um, some of them were, were very inspiring and very motivating. Um, to the point where, you know, I was I was sculpting forms and um, kind of incorporating them in my artwork. Uh, I got a scholarship in, in painting on my final year of high school, uh, and some of the themes I was painting then were kind of geometric ET related. Um, fasting fast forward to um, two thousand and five. Uh, I actually went through colon cancer at age 28. So uh, this was a major, you know, satin return, as people who are familiar with star charts will, will tell you. It's a very transformative time when we go through another quadrant and satin, the energy of transformation, comes back into our chart and throws your whole world upside down and, and realigns you if you're ready for it. So I, I had colon cancer, and this this kind of opened up a story for me that has really led me to, to this point where I am now. I had a what I believe or what I understand to be a near-death experience when I was in hospital where, uh, you know, the, 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 the incision that I'd had through, through, my, through my abdomen had become infected and I was standing, I found myself standing on what felt like a cliff edge and it was just it was just beautiful. It was just these beautiful pastel kind of colours and sparkling scintillating light. A lot of kind of silver and violet and gold kind of hues, you know, just phasing. And I, I was kind of leaning leaning into what felt like a, a canyon and it was about to fly off. And then I realized, well, hang on a second, this is death. You know, and uh, it was it was incredible because I felt this falling back. You know, I think I was partially out of my body then, or well, may have been fully out of my body. And uh, I heard this voice say, you have so much more to do. You know, so I felt this energy of kind of collapsing back into my body and then woke up to my mother, you know, 
with their hands on my shoulders saying, wake up, Jeremy, you know. So I had a very, very high fever. I had an infection in my colon. So at that point, um, I chose to live. And uh, I got off the painkillers. So the anesthetist didn't want to stop the morphine, but I, I got off later. I think it was later that day or the next morning, if I remember correctly. He really didn't want me to get off them. Um, but this is in Darwin in Australia at the Royal Darwin Hospital. And uh, he was coming in every 15 minutes checking on me. And, uh, you know, he, he came in later later on one day. Had been, it had been about, I think, half a day had elapsed. And he, and he had been checking on me regularly. And he said, hey, you know, how are you doing? You know, I said, I'm, I'm okay. You know, he says, how's the pain? I said, well, I'm working through it. You know, I was on some lighter painkillers, but I wasn't on the opiates. And um, he said, what are you doing? And I said, well, this is what happened. And he said, oh, okay. And he, he just kind of acknowledged it as being normal, as something that he's wow. experienced before. So this, this was this was a major uh, realignment in terms of my life purpose and times in, in terms of me being here. So that's why I wanted to share that. Um, and it opened up the what I'm really fascinated in about this is our multidimensional nature and the non-locality of our consciousness and the omnipresence of consciousness itself. So. From that point onwards, I started to, um, you know, have uh, uh, out-of-body experiences, uh, which, you know, most of them were supported by uh, another type of intelligence. So there's forms that will come in that space. And uh, I learned that, you know, what I'd been experiencing in my teenage years, which, you know, sleep paralysis is actually a launch pad into these altered states of consciousness. So whether that be a lucid dream or whether that be a full out-of-body experience. So, yeah, all of all of that kind of transpired. Um, and th- there are many different experiences that, that went through that, that time frame. And so I, I studied a lot between the age of 29 and about 35 I was studying a lot of different ancient wisdoms, um, different types of healing modalities, uh, consciousness practices, uh, neuro-linguistics, uh, anything and everything else, just lapping it up and kind of applying it in my own way. And then in 20, I think it was 2012, 2013, I saw Sirius. So I was in Bali at the time and was uh, doing a fast. And so I was kind of in that elevated state. And then I watched this film and I went, oh, my God, I, I need to get involved with this. You know, this is like I got that that magnetic pull on my heart. You know, I was like, wow, this is fantastic. So I, I did a bit of investigation. And then the following year, I, I was considering, I was really looking at the Serious Disclosure website and Dr. Greer's work and really considering attending a training. And I'd been, I'd been building a whole lot of musical instruments. I was in Byron Bay in Australia. This was April 2014. And, uh, yeah, I'd been building these West African harps that I make, these gonies, and uh, for a festival. And I'd kind of overworked myself and was really uh, depleted physically. And so I, I went to bed early that night in my friend's house bus with a um, with a bit of a fever. And that, that morning at around is probably three or four, uh, I, I sat up out of my body. So I literally sat up and looked at my body and thought, oh, my God, it is very, very vivid. Um, usually with OBEs, you don't see your body because it snaps you straight back in. You know, you, there's a certain amount of fear response initially that kind of, un, what is it, unconscious kind of, whoa, what's going on? And then you're back in your body. Is a house bus case, like a camper? Yeah, yeah, like a, like a, yeah, like a camper, so it's a yeah, mobile home, um, an RV, yeah, you call yeah, them, don't okay. you? Okay. Yeah, 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 okay. Yeah, so I was in there, and um, so I sat up out of my body, and I looked at myself, and I didn't even have a chance to kind of do anything else, because at the end of the, the house bus was this very tall, golden humanoid form that looked like, you know, people talk about light beings, you know. Uh, it was standing there at the edge of, at the end of the bus, and, uh, you know, I'm kind of just going, what is going on? And it's, it's very, very vivid. And it's standing behind what I described as uh, 
being like molten glass or water, but there's fields of geometry in it as well. So it's, it, it, it feels very trans-dimensional. And it passed with its hands this sphere, this blue sphere that was encased in a, in a cube. This, and it gave it to me and I went, well, this is what I'm experiencing. I put, placed it in my heart and I woke up. Wow. And was, was in my body. And, and then what I saw... And what I felt, like this, there's this enormous electrostatic field in the in, in the bus at the time. So, the term pilo erection, it's a funny term, but for for your hair standing on end. So everything was, you know, that it was it was huge, and that dissipated as I watched this kind of shadow, kind of move out of the house bus. So that that was in C five terms. That was my confirmation. That was yeah. my yes. You should go and do this training. Now, the interesting thing that happened is um, at, at the first training I had with Dr. Greer in the Yucca Valley uh, in April 2015. So the following year, pretty much to the to the date when I had that experience, uh, the same being appeared again, and I I went out of body in the C five circle and had um, an incredible experience, and then. Through that, and through having the courage to share what I had experienced in the circle, um, and that's thanks to a, a good friend of mine, Jeff Sell. He was really kind of nudging me on <laughs> to say, "Share what you just experienced," because I was a little bit apprehensive, you know. And so it's it, it's pretty wild when you start describing these experiences, especially to people that um, you know might be a bit skeptical or, or haven't got any kind of any of their uh, what's the term. Like they don't really think at all like that. They're very cognitive or analytical, you know. So yeah, he encouraged me to share, and then Dr. Greer um, started verifying what I was saying, and all the technology was going off. So there's there's things like this, these radar detectors that are used, uh, these trifield meters, and so forth. So there's there's certain interfaces that confirm communication when people are sharing in the circle. So that ha that happened, and. Um, this this particular type of intelligence has has showed itself and presented in various ways. A lot of the time, it's been when I've um, been in a in a out of body experience or in a lucid dream. But I've also had um, numerous experiences with it where it has interfaced with with this particular um, electromagnetic meter. Uh, it has responded with flashing lights in the sky. So I will say in consciousness, is this you? And speak its name and consciousness. Can you give me two flashes of light from the sky? One, two. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So you, you kind of, it gets really wild and it gets really unbelievable. And, and the thing that I love about it is, is really, we don't know what's going on. We can only describe the experiences we have and we can only really do that. And then tolerate, as one of my mentors, a, a genius of a man in Australia called Jeff Dugan, says to me one time when I was studying with him, he says, you know, do you know what you don't know? And he says, you know, do you really value not knowing? And I think that it's, it's a really critical question in this field because in my experience, there's a lot of labeling and there's a lot of these beings are from here and these beings do this and these reasons. And it's, it's contrived, and it's, it's coming from a belief system in most cases. It's actually not from experience. You know, and that's what I do love about you know, genuine CE5 practice is we go out into the field. We don't have a clue what's going to happen, but we center on our heart. We have a clear intention with an elevated emotion. We extend that out. So we're in this frequency of love and peace and unity consciousness and so forth. So we're resonating with that energy to start with, and then different things happen, and we, we never know what's going to happen, but it's always wild, and it's always really, that was my radar detector that just, yeah, so someone's communicating now. It's always wild, and it's always fun, so, <laughs> yeah, that's, that's thank you. Um, yeah, so it's, I find, you know, the, the, the aspects of, you know, stumbling into the darkness as a, as a human being, and with 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 this loving intention, but without any expectation and without knowing. And then when something happens, just to maintain the ability of, okay, that happened. 
I'm not going to turn it into anything other than the experience. Yeah. I'm going to talk about what I experienced, write it down, write a report maybe. And, and then if you can tolerate not knowing and allow the information to become known, it does. And th that way we're not limiting our experience and turning it into a belief and going down. We might be going in a completely different direction or an opposite to, to what's actually going on. So, yeah. Yeah, that that's a little, no. Yeah. That's a good background. Yeah, it's got into, yeah, just got what, into a big monologue there. No, that's me. great. I mean, it's fantastic. It I makes think. me wonder if like things like because uh, you wonder if something like say a church ceremony or maybe back in the day a bunch of hunter gatherers going on a hunt or looking for water or something like that. If you could sort of fall into that same sort of consciousness, sort the of coherence, thing, yeah. same sort of coherence that you guys would describe going out on a C five thing, I'm, I wonder if it's like yeah. this lost sort of thing that that you can access in different ways like that. Definitely, yeah. I mean, there's so many there's so many studies and so many wonderful things coming up now with coherence, isn't there? You know, because it is very critical to the survival of us on this planet. You know, the, our, our planet's fine. Our planet would be better off with us, right? Better off without us right now, right? You know, with how we're behaving. But if we shift into alignment with our planet and live in ways that are genuinely aligned with our our planet in terms of sustainability, then we could be of benefit to to her. You know, as we say, Papa Tuanuku here, our Earth Mother. Uh, the the thing. I found with, you know, like people like Joe Dispenza and Bruce Lipton and Nassim Haramein as well, of course, all these people that are looking at coherence, the HeartMath Institute in, in the USA, they do incredible work, is that coherence is, you know, fundamental to creating a frequency where other types of intelligence uh, or, or our own even, our own multidimensional nature can become known. So, you know, if we look at the bioelectromagnetic field of the heart and how that functions, so our zero point right here, and, you know, the torus field coming up through, out through the crown and then down and around and up through the spine and, uh, you know, phasing. When, when we are in a state of fear or we have what we, what we say, what people experience anyway as a negative emotion, I don't believe any of them are negative or positive it's it's purely contextual you know fear is a good a good thing if a, if a hungry lion's running after you it's good to be scared you know what i mean it, it it's might not save negative in that it's not negative uh, in that aspect no that. Yeah. no but it but it is in the case of you know another context so all meaning is context dependent yeah. so if we're if we're looking at our taurus energy field and you know we're in that state of you know fear or something our whole energy field is retracted and we're reducing our capabilities to interact energetically with each other and our environment. Yet if we, you know, and the HeartMath Institute has proven this, they've measured someone's heart field from over 15 feet when they're in a state of, of real joy and unity and love and peace. Uh, literally, our energy field expands. So we're amplifying our abilities. We're amplifying our abilities to feel and to experience and communicate because, you know, bioelectromagnetic fields contain information. They contain the information of what we're communicating without this. You know what I mean? I mean, some linguistics will, professionals will say that the majority of what we're talking about, you know, of what we're communicating about, you know, is coming from our physiology and coming from our energy. About 7%, 7-8%, according to some neurolinguistics, is actually language-based. So, you know, you walk into a room where someone is uh, feeling something negative. You might have had a great day. You come home and someone's feeling something negative. Immediately, you can feel it. So there's a lot that goes on there. And when we get together in teams and we focus on the Taurus and creating a really strong energy field through, you know, having a clear intention, of course. Um, so that's the direction, the purpose of us gathering, but also you know, the energy and motion concept. So what is the energy and motion of joy? What is the energy and motion of, of peace? What does it look like? How does it feel? How do we experience that? And bringing that and enlivening our energy field and then sharing that with each other in the team. So let's say there's 20 people doing this and they've all got the same intent. They're all experiencing something similar. And then that becomes one giant torus. And so then you've created individual coherence. You've created 
collective coherence. And then we extend that around the planet with the idea that because this is a universal structure, you know, this is one of the primary energy forms, if not the primary energy form. I think Nassim would, would say that that's the case, you know, at a molecular level and, and at a at a universal scale, it's the it's the energy form of galaxies and all sorts of things. Then then we can kind of merge our consciousness and merge our energy within that structure. And that's where we can when we're in a state of flow, and especially when we have a connection with uh, these energy fields that do come through um, in the context of C5, the support of energy flow, that's when we can anchor these frequencies into the vibratory field of the planet through unity consciousness and understanding that uh, consciousness is omnipresent, you know, that it, it is within all of us and, and it naturally flows within every single being and every life, life form on our planet and our planet itself, then we can kind of step things up a bit and step out of fear and step out of hatred and division and, and uplift into unity and peace. You know, so I find all of these things really fascinating to explore because it's an emerging science. Um, I mean, my dad was a physicist. He, he lived in a, in a library of, like his home library of almost 6,000 books before he died. He died really young. He, he didn't, didn't look after his body, he fed his brain. Um, but he, you know, I, I kind of have that perspective just by being around him, you know, of kind of this, this fascination with... Um, making sense of things, but not necessarily from a cognitive um, perspective. There is that, of course, but the, the flip side, and I'm, I'm really grateful for this, was that my, my mother's mother, Jessie Grace is her name, uh, she is blind. And, you know, I grew up, she would, she would look after us as kids, and she always knew where we were, <laughs> you know. Me and my sister, we'd, we'd, we'd be totally silent, and she'd just kind of look over us and point Mm. Yeah, well, like mm. so. Growing up with this kind of experience of how does that work? You know, it raises this curiosity, and so that's where I like to engage with CE five from that perspective. Really, uh, you know, I think it was Stanton Stanton Friedman was it that said um, the true purpose of science is to investigate the unexplained, not explain the uninvestigated. You know? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, so <laughs> that's that's yeah. I mean, isn't it? I yeah. wonder what the benefit is of those like heart fields overlapping with each other and not being isolated. Well, what, that's a great question and, and a great point. The thing I'm currently developing um, an OBE platform to, you know, I'm recording, uh, you know, with my background in sound engineering and, and music, um, I'm recording some meditations at the moment. They're kind of like inductions to get into an OBE state. And there's a team of us that are putting these into practice. Uh, the other day, a friend of mine who is based in Kansas, she led a meditation on Zoom. And uh, I kind of remote viewed what was going on beforehand. And I felt that there were, there, there were going to be uh, too many participants for, for um, her Zoom account, which was limited to 100. So I got up at... Um, quarter to five in the morning here in New Zealand and I sent her a message on WhatsApp. I said, look, I'm not going to join in face to face. I'm just going to do an OBE practice and do an experiment and I'll talk to you about it later on. So I just let her know that. So what I did is, is I went through my own OBE practice. Uh, we already have a very, and this is the important point that I need to highlight. We already have a very deep state of coherence between us that we've developed through our friendship and through transparency and complete openness, and this is really important. You know, the more open and the more free and the more transparent people are with the information that they hold, you know, that this is my life, it's an open story kind of concept, um, the, the easier it is to be in deep state of coherence. So we have that as, as the kind of platform that we're operating from. And uh, the interesting thing was I, I intentionally took my energy to support her in, in guiding this meditation, and I said in consciousness, okay, he's using what's called the target technique, which is something that William Bjorman talks a lot about and, and Robert Monroe, two pioneers of, of OBEs. Uh, you know, you, you basically start anchoring your physical or your kinesthetic state through really strong uh, visualization in a certain environment. So the, the usual thing that people do is they 
will go to the door. And because we're so anchored to the front door of our house, if we continually place our, our intent to be there, non-locally, out of our body, and to hold the door and really examine it, we start to start to generate a kinesthetic a felt state there and we can go out of body spontaneously from that point. So I was doing that with her right hand. I was saying, okay, I'm here, I'm holding your right hand. And then we went off and, and we had this experience where we were on a slither of a, a white ribbon of light, which I've seen many times before in, in um, out-of-body experiences and meditations. And uh, I saw a specific type of ET being that was playing with this little light geometric form. And I, th I thought, okay, well, that's what I experienced. So I sent her a WhatsApp message. And I said, look, this is, this is what I, I did, and I hope you had a great time, and this is what I experienced. So she writes back to me, with a, a, or records back to me with a voice message, oh, my God, I felt someone came, I felt a physical sensation on my right hand. You know, so she reports that. So there's one point of connection. She also reports uh, familiarity with the white ribbon of light. And then, the, and this is a critical point, the intelligence that I saw in consciousness, this small, it was like a childlike ET, very small, very playful, very friendly, very loving, and it had this little geometric form in its hand. She said, that is exactly what I saw. So... You know then, don't you, that we're dealing with some type of information, you know. The, the chance of that happening is so minutely small. And then when you're, when you're in a coherent team and you've got, you've got activity up in the sky, you've got all of the devices going off, the radios, the, the trifield meters, the radar detectors, you've got, you know, signaling from the sky, like I was saying, and then you've got people who are describing the same things internally from a state of meditation, like a silent meditation, and people come to a point where where we're sharing what we've been experiencing internally, and people are saying, oh, yeah, I saw two double tetrahedrons, they were blue, and there was this golden kind of sphere around them, and someone else says, oh, my God, I saw exactly the same thing, and then someone else says, oh, my God, I saw exactly the same thing. So that's confirmation. And that's really what we're dealing with here in a, in a lot of cases is, you know, of course, everything is consciousness based. But when we get those shared internal representations, those shared remote views and those connections, we know we're dealing with information. We're not making this up. Yeah. You know, yeah, <laughs> so I mean, that, that's a good point. Yeah. I mean, Darren was talking about I think you were talking about like what if our heart toruses were physically overlapping, intermingling. But like you're showing yeah. there, I mean, it doesn't even matter if we're in the room or not. I mean, there's a resonance there between people that are connected yeah. where you're connecting. I get that on yeah. a focused, maybe an intended standpoint, yeah. but I mean, it's kind of like, I don't know. It's, I don't know. I, yeah, maybe I feel yeah. like there could be that, like, it's kind of like the sun shining on you. You know what I mean? Like you get this sort of basking effect from, from being with your tribe. That you, that you can't just replicate from, you know, wishing or concentrating or because I, I got a lot of time for remote viewing and, and, and that sort of thing. But I still think there's uh -huh. still something about I mean, we had a gathering here on the weekend for the first time in a while. And I mean, all the Zoom calls in the fucking world can't can't duplicate it. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, and that's very true because we are very bound to our three dimensional reality right now, aren't we? So we, we do need that. You know, we do need hugs. We do need contact in that way. And there is, you know, I, I totally miss my crew. You know, we haven't been out in the field together face to face for, for quite a while. Um, but I'm out under the stars most nights anyway. But yeah, it's, it's interesting that the, the non-locality of all of this is, is really um, what fascinates me and, and how people can communicate us, you know, like what we are actually capable of and what we are, you know, relearning through the process of the self-reflection, you know, and kind of engaging with that and going, well, we are multidimensional. We are infinite. Now, prove it. Okay. <laughs> All right. How can I prove that? Well, I can prove it to myself through a near-death experience or through an out-of-body experience. Now, can I prove it for someone else? No. Can I prove there's a connection there? Yes. So 
you know, that, that's where it comes down to our own individual um, desire to experience that for ourselves. You know, when you've left your body and, and you've felt your consciousness outside of this spacesuit, you know without a doubt that we don't die. So th that is transformative in itself. And then when you experience your, your body as a physical form, let's say, but it's not physical. So in, in what William Bjorman refers to as the, the parallel energy substructure of this physical density... So we're, all, we're just out of phase in terms of frequency from, from this physical reality. So we are still, we are scintillating light in a physical form. And we can touch ourselves and we can hold our arm and feel it just like we are now. However, I can also put my arm through a wall or walk through it, but I can still flip the light switch on. So, you know, these are things that we experience, yet describing them to people they look at you kind of sideways they go huh but if you have the opportunity to experience it then you learn the reality of that you know so this is the thing there's no it, this is, it revolves around belief systems and it revolves around the willingness to engage in the work to do that you know so that that's where it's really about the individual and where they're at yeah. You know, so yeah. ultim ultimately we headbutt with our own beliefs repeatedly yeah. until we go beyond belief, until we learn what we don't know. Yeah. You know, yeah. and, and hold, hold that space of not knowing. You yeah. know, okay. I thought I was this physical body, but that's just irrelevant. Okay. Yeah. I wanted to get What's back next? to, uh, I wanted to get back to that part about your sleep paralysis being a jumping off point. Like, were you talking about yeah. in those exact instances of going OBE or are you talking about more from a, philosophical standpoint yeah they are and this was confirmed when i studied with william bielman at the monroe institute just last year in april uh it was hilarious because i would kind of learned that through my own experience that it was this opportunity to um get out of body it, it presented the opportunity to um when i when i first was experiencing it as a teenager you, like i said earlier it used to scare me because i felt like i couldn't breathe and like i was being held you know and 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 i'd, I'd get so frightened i'd wake up and i'd break the state nowadays i recognize it as a as a, a you know it's neither here or there it's like a launch pad to to go into those obes and my process now around that is i just take a breath as funny as that sounds, because we don't breathe um, in that energy environment. Uh, and I say, I am safe. And then uh, I will use a, a separation technique, which usually is, is sit up or roll out. So uh, I will tell my consciousness to roll out of my body and then I'm off, you know. And then the, the, the main principles with, with OBE there is get as far away from your body, your physical body, as quickly as possible. Don't think about it, otherwise you will... Snap back, Snap back in. into yeah. your body. Yeah. 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 And so William Bielman confirmed that, yes, sleep paralysis is, is definitely uh, a, an ideal opportunity to go into an OBE state. Are so, you, you going to put yeah. some of your music through the Monroe Institute at all? Or, like, is that, do you uh, think music, uh, music and this uh, sound is a real important part of helping people? Yeah. I mean, I've tried all kinds of Monroe ones and I, I have a hard time. I can't really mm -hmm. leave my body. I've tried a bunch of different ones from, from the Institute. Yeah, the, the, I think um, with what's going on in this context now, there's a lot of really fascinating things going on, starting with, you know, the, the whole activation of the corpus callosum through the, you know, binaural beats that, that um, Rob Monroe pioneered, you know, so that four hertz differential that helps us get into that whole brain state. But now there's things like spatial angular modulation. Um, I, I personally use Factor 9 Fibonacci. I find that to be a, a really good structure to use to apply in, in Hertz and then create rotational-based files from there that help us get into altered states. So we are frequency beings, so of course when we have supportive frequencies um, to resonate with, uh, they, they definitely help us. And that combined with a clear intention um, and also supportive language to, to go through it, you know, so whether that be, um, you know, a trance induction language patterning or uh, just a gentle guided meditation, that people are different, you know, so people have to find their own way that works. Um, what, what's common initially, I find, is, is guidance. And one of the affirmations that, that 
people use a lot when they're in kind of that phase shift out of between, you know, the hypnagogic and the hypnopompic, when we're, whether we're rising out of sleep or going into sleep, is um, guidance now, assistance now. And you'll be surprised who shows up, you know. People report family members coming in and seeing them and taking them and showing them somewhere. People even talk about pets, you know, coming along and, and being led by, a, by the, the animal that they loved as a child. And there's a lot of um, people that report having experiences with uh, what are often referred to as light beings or, or extraterrestrial in appearance. You know, that's how they present. Um, I think the form for a lot of these types of consciousness is irrelevant. It's really how they present to us in order for us to have a relationship with them. I think if you're a highly, highly advanced being and you don't actually have a physical form, and you don't have, you don't need uh, an extraterrestrial vehicle or, or any type of vehicle to move through what we call space and time. Then form is irrelevant. Your conscious light, in some cases, you know what the ancients would call angels. Yeah. You know, so there's in the context of C five, we experience all sorts of parameters. You know, there's what people call the celestial realm, the extraterrestrial realm, the kind of uh, spiritual realm. There's, you know, there's obviously being such as us that have passed away in terms of her physical body and they're still kind of phasing in and out of, of this reality. So people might experience them as a as a ghost, you know, whereas really it's it's a it's a person and the Monroe Institute does a lot of work like this, helping they need some help to cross over. Yeah, the spirit lost, rescue stuff. Lost their yeah, way. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's fascinating. So so this kind of is all at play, the whole kind of cosmology is at play when you when you're in the CE5 context, which yeah. I find fascinating. Yeah, yeah, it is. It's mind blowing. So, do you think that orb has that orb that was pushed into your uh, the blue orb that you sort of pushed into your heart? Has that come to play yeah. at all? Is that was that a yeah? Like, was it's that... interesting you asked that. Yeah, because it, it did. It came to play again in another out of body experience. So I was with another type of consciousness which had a tetrahedron type form, and we have a photo of this consciousness. So, my friend Jeff was was smart enough to. Um, suggest taking a photo of it. This was at this training in 2015. And uh, <laughs> uh, so, yeah, there's uh, some importance to sharing this, obviously. Uh, the, um, there's a tetrahedron form, and I kept saying it's over my, over my shoulder, you know. And so he took a photo, and we didn't notice anything on the camera, but then we put it on a big screen, and there's this tetrahedron form right over my shoulder. And the interesting thing for me was that it matched exactly the sketch I'd done the day before. Wow. You know, so this is this is in a big report that I wrote to CCETI um, and, and showed to Dr. Greer in uh, 2016 in Joshua Tree when I did another training with him and, and the crew. Um and that's called explorations in consciousness. So yeah, it, it, that sphere was kind of sh presented, if you like, um, as a, I guess, I don't know what was going on, but uh, this consciousness was there when I was out of body and it, it was kind of just present and it felt as though I needed to do something. And then I realized, oh, maybe this has something to do with it. So. I presented this blue sphere and then I was off on this white ribbon of light again. Wow. So, yeah, it's it, it's fascinating stuff because, uh, you know, it, it sounds so mystical and so unbelievable until you start experiencing it for yourself. Yeah, yeah. You know, and that, that's really what I keep coming back to. I can share these and people might look at me sideways or they might jump in the mix. Whatever people do is, is their own individual response, and I encourage people to find out for themselves, you know, and to have their own experiences. That's the whole point of CE5. Yeah, that's know? what we were shouting about for, for years now is, like, I don't have to prove it to anybody. I can just You go out and that's right. experience it yourself, and you can... Believe yeah. it or not, or whatever, and I don't, I don't, I didn't have any of the answers, but we see flash bulbs in response to questions, and exactly. light, lights flying around, and stuff happening, and you're like, wow, there's something going on here, and it's not just uh, in our imagination because there's multiple people well, experiencing. Clearly, it. Yeah. you need to prove it to me before you can take <laughs> me with you. Yeah, well, you can come. I can come. Yeah. I'm in. <laughs> jump, but, jump in the deep end. I've been banned from C five events due to my potential disbelief. <laughs> And Graham's ability to summon UFOs. 
Well, I, I think you're in the right place in the circle then. There you go. Not allowed in? Yeah. No, no. Oh, no. see? You're this is yeah, you're, 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 I'm in. Definitely. That's, that's your passport in. People that don't believe. We'll yeah. Go, yeah, we'll go this Jump summer. We'll circle. go this summer, though. <laughs> we'll go this summer. I, I, we haven't, I haven't done it as I'm much I'm not coming lately, unless but... you drop the no weed rule. Oh, yeah. See, that's what it was about. It was more about the, <laughs> oh, the substance yeah, abuse. Yeah. Than... The substance abuse. <laughs> <Cool>. <laughs> If you quit for one day, oh, well, you can come. <laughs> no, just... so uh, my my friend Mike does have a a question on orbs. Now that you're talking about orbs, he he uh, with with this this sort of outer layer of these orbs and maybe like a geometrical shape inside. Like, what what is your feeling of what these what these things are? I think you kind yeah. of answered it already in a way, but it could well, be a number they... of things. If I, if I talk about uh, one of the experiences we had, the, the first international CE5 event that we organized here in New Zealand was in 2016. Uh, on the very first night, we'd just finished. Uh, I did a, a karakia, uh, like a blessing. Another lady did a karanga, which is like a, a, a welcoming. And we just kind of settled down and, and started getting into the C5 protocols when this, the whole valley started lighting up with these big, um, you, you'd kind of summarize them as being like big floodlights, but they were coming up from the ground and like searchlights. And they were all up and down this valley. And we were very, very remote. This is in the South Island of New Zealand, one of the most remote places in New Zealand. Um, big cattle stations, you know, no one around. And we watched these lights condense into what looked like a string of beads. And uh, three of us went down uh, to, to investigate and got as close as we could to it. And what we saw was these pulsing spheres of light in this what looks like a, a, a big line of beads, and they're all different colors. And at the same time, th th we were about probably 800 meters or a, or a kilometer away, we estimate it was hard to say because we're in an old glacial feed valley, you know, like we're separated by, a, by multiple rivers. And this kind of materialized out of the mountain as an ETV, and it was huge. But in the center were all these spheres of light. And I could feel and hear this kind of, this very specific frequency pulsing from it as at the same time as seeing this, this form starting to take shape on the bottom and the top. So it was kind of the neutrino light, and it was starting to phase in and become this fully materialized ETV. At the same time that was happening, with, there were all these spheres of light that were generating off the top surface of this disk and blasting off into the sky. It was absolutely incredible to, to witness this. They were very, very big. Some of them were going into the ground. Some of them were going into the sky. Um, so that happened, and um, you see these kind of around the, the team a lot. You see different types of spheres of energy coming around. They often move through the heart. So I've had a, I've had a friend who's, who's seen one, um, at, at, like physically with his own eyes, seen one move through my heart, a violet-colored one. I've seen one um, when I was below an ETV in the USA, and uh, we have a photo of this one. I said to my friend Jeff, um, there's, a, there's a violet orb there. And he took a quick snap and it showed up in the photo. <laughs> so th there's numerous possibilities as to what they can be. Um, we, we've also, yeah, there's a photo that we have where there's a, a visible orb in the field. And it was photographed at a distance. And when you zoom into it, you can see two tetrahedrons, the Merkaba form. Right, you know, right. This, that's this what he's form talking here. about. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's exactly right. So there's um, there's all sorts of um, speculation as to what's going on. I know that they're definitely associated with energy and to a degree with communication. Um, and I think in some cases the different types of colors are representative of different types of functions, perhaps. So, you know, I, I don't like speculating too much, but in my own experience, um, I, I know that they're associated with, with an energy, with a certain consciousness, and a certain um, opening into learning. Uh, for example, 
we often experience here in New Zealand these very small pinpoint lights. So we call them scintillating lights, and they're often at the edge of the forest, and they're usually red and white. And so they can only be these, usually these tiny little pinpoint lights, but when you engage with them, quite often you'll see a bigger flash. So it's kind of like they're, they're leading us in a certain direction um, to pay attention and to become more aware of what's going on and how they're actually communicating with us, you know? Yep. yep. So there's, there's, there's often a real subtlety at the beginning, and then when you engage with that subtlety, something more obvious comes out. And that's what I find is quite common in relation to um, what people call orbs. There's some people that speculate that they are, um, you know, a, a type of um, probe, you know, a type of scanning um, intelligence that comes in and has a look around and then goes back to the vehicle that they've come from. Other people will say that they're actually a, a conscious light being themselves. Yeah. So we don't know, but we'll find out eventually, yeah. you yeah. know. And when, there's, when it's scientific, when it's replicated and when it becomes a science and when we, you know, yeah. No, without a doubt. That's where we can comment. So these are all ideas at this stage. Is yeah. it the Pleiadians yeah. are the light beings? That's the Pleiadians? Yeah, well, I, I'm, I'm assuming they could be, yeah. But, yeah. I, we, we have a, a, a legend here in Aotearoa that comes from Matariki, as we call it here, the Pleiades um, star system of Te Waka Huru Huru Manu, which is the the canoe made of um, birds feathers that flew from um, Matariki constellation and landed in the mist and this is where the um, what are commonly referred to as Patupaiare here the little people that live, live in the forest um, their Patupaiare here gets translated into English as as a type of fairy forest being so you know the, these legends are all across the planet of of this association with mist, um, there's a definite connection to um, the Pleiades, uh, as, as you know, and you know the Dogon people, uh, not the Dogon, sorry. The in in, um, in Japan they call it Subaru. There's a whole lot of different cultures that relate to that star system. So there's well, obviously right. the a connection Subaru there. Subaru logo oh. is the Pleiades. Oh. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Yeah, I'm, I'm seven, wearing, the I'm seven, wearing it around the, my neck. The seven sisters. The, oh, it's... Yeah. We had an experience with the Pleiades when we were out with, uh, I think Celia was there and Corrine. And uh, yeah. it, I, we didn't know it was going to happen, but the, the constellation rose off the horizon. And I think it was a time when there was some forest fires. There was some haze or fog, speaking of mist, on the horizon. And uh, uh -huh. it looked like this blue, amorphous blob. And I couple of us jumped out of our chair and we ran like 10 or 15 feet over like what is that and my first uh my first instinct was it was the Pleiades, but then it looked so odd and and weird it looked like this alive sort of amorphous blob and then uh it as it rose we could tell it was the Pleiades. but i think actually when we mentioned something there was a flash bulb right over top to like basically in answer of what our what our questions was it was uh, really interesting it was like three in the morning yeah, yeah, rising up. So I thought maybe you know I was thinking afterwards, if people, if primitive people saw that, you know, not knowing what mm. that was, I mean, who knows why some of these legends, you know, and myths, you know, happened, right? Yeah, northern, like northern, northern lights were there too that night. You know, northern lights. I like the idea. It's this landing spaceship. That's what the mist was. Yeah, yeah well, th that's quite accurate, actually. There's often big fields of mist that come in prior to an extraterrestrial vehicle manifesting. So the, the whole idea that people have of something flying down from the sky and landing on the ground and, the, you know, beings coming out, I think is a really three-dimensional um, kind of inaccurate way of, of looking at it. In my experience, um, they emerge, you know, so they, they just start materializing. They're, they're, they're already present in some degree, but then they make themselves known by materializing into this local space-time. Um, and that can happen very, very quickly. Sometimes there's, a, there's more of a... Uh, it depends where you are and, and what the conditions are, you know, whether there's other types of, you know, assets in the area, whether the military are, are keeping an eye on things or not. But 
if you're in an environment where there isn't much of that going on, um, things can happen gradually and people can become acclimatised to it through this gradual kind of... Look at that field of mist over there. Now there's lights in that field of mist. Now it looks like it's an ellipse and then all of a sudden there's a vehicle there. So yeah. um, uh, in, in the way that they interact with us, they're very much training us as to how their technology works and how consciousness actually functions. So that, that's, that's the part of CE5 that I find really wonderful as well, is that they do that. And they're very, very patient with how they interact with us. You know, very, very patient. Uh, yeah, in my experience anyway. So I saw the movie last night, The Close Encounters of the Fifth Kind. I forgot that oh, you yeah. were, I forgot that you actually had a little cameo in there. You played, you played yeah. you're in yeah. there. Um, I was super happy with the film. I thought it was great. I'm going to recommend it mm. to all our listeners. going to get Darren to watch it. Actually fits in with a lot of the stuff we've talked about. I mean, it was loaded with really good C five footage too. I mean, I was really happy with. Yeah. Like we don't we when we went out we don't really take we didn't really focus on gathering you know photographic or video evidence. It just seemed to a lot of times I just we wanted to experience what was going on and you know a lot of the stuff we would see it doesn't really translate well. But there was a lot of really cool footage uh, in that uh, in that video. Not that it, it's about the footage, but the stuff you had to say was great. The uh, the whole quantum physics aspect and the one percent of uh, yeah, you know, yeah, it was, it was good. Were you happy with the way yeah. it turned out? Yeah, yeah. I, I, I think Michael Mazzola and the film crew did a, a fantastic job, and uh, you know, I really love that Danny Sheehan um, featured in it so much as well. He's just a he's a spectacular man in many ways. He's just such a, a, a an amazing person with what what he does for our planet and and you know the work he's doing is incredible. But yeah, everyone's contribution was was fantastic, and you know I, I know the majority of the people um, and have worked with the majority of the people in, in the film. Uh, I, I was you know happy that the, the segment that um, I was in was was talking about the, a, a critical issue that people face, which is overcoming fear. You know, because we are so programmed to this and that through being here and through having, through being part of our consensual reality, which is duality right now, which is separation and which is division. That's the current consensual agreement that we have with each other, being here, you know. So we've got to shift out of that into unity. And, you know, that's that's really what we get challenged with, with, um, with CE5, you know, is to really greet each experience in a loving, beautiful way, and when our fear comes up, and it does, you know, you can't say that if you're standing in the field with a 12-foot being walking towards you, you can't say you're not going to experience some degree of fear. If you if you do, then you're lying. <laughs> you know, there's always going to be this element of, you know, it's it's built into us currently, but we're moving through that as a species, and we will get through. So, you know, it, that, it's, it's that whole, what is it, um, Face everything and rise, you know, that kind of element. To I was going to kind of ask you about that in in a protection sense or in a some because mm. you know, if you believe in some of these realities that were you know people can summon whatever I mean demons and devils mm. and and you know yeah. archons and I mean how do you protect yourself or the group or how do you address the risk that if you're opening up a portal or a door or something yeah. that that. Uh, that you're, you know, that you're reaching the right thing and something's not playing tricks on you or saying that they are yeah. something that they're not. I mean, it really seems legit and loving to me, but I, I wonder about, you know, the government and what they know about the bad ETs mm -hmm. or if there is those and then and then the, mm -hmm. the risk of that sort of occult influence on, on what you're doing, you know? Well, I'm happy you brought this up because it is a legitimate um, consideration for everybody and very much a point that turns people off. So, you know, when, when we look at the history, recent history of when extraterrestrials started making their presence known on Earth, and I say making their presence known, they didn't have to. When was it and what was the context? So it was around nuclear silos. And it was in the context of concern for what we were doing and what we, de we were developing. So you, you look in recent history when... You know, it, it, there's all these reports from various mid nuclear 40s, silos. Mid-40s, kind of in the mid-40s. Yeah, yeah. yeah. After, after Hiroshima and Nagasaki, that's when there was this presence. 
you know, uh, around the Nallis Range, Area 51 and so forth, where nuclear facilities are. That, so there's there's all sorts of disclosure and unacknowledged, you know, if people want to learn more about that that are listening, just watch unacknowledged, watch the testimonies from the people that are in that. So that says a lot in itself, you know, that, that the fact that they were around those facilities and that in some cases they were uh, actively, uh, you know, turning things off you know, or, or showing that they have the ability to do that, you know. So these testimonies are out. Dr. Greer's done amazing work with getting this information out there. So that's one aspect to it. Um, the other aspect, of course, is what Hollywood produces. You know, so for many, many years we've been slammed with films about, you know, all sorts of different types of, you know, Predator, Independence Day, so forth, in recent years, though, and this is what's really interesting, we've had movies like Contact. We've had movies like Midnight Special. We've had a movie called Clara. If you haven't seen the film Clara, wow, that was incredible. So the consciousness is changing in the sense of what we're understanding um, to be the reality. You know, So we, we do have a lot of programming there to, to, to unwind. Um, so there's those two aspects that are at play, but there's also... Um, of course, our belief system that comes up based on just, you know, how we've been brought up. What, what do you believe? Do you believe in angels and devils? Do you, you know, do you believe in good and bad? Are you, are you inclined to think in duality or, or do you think elsewhere? So, you know, an example of this is, you know, here in, in Aotearoa, there are um, different legends in terms of interaction with Patupayata here, these forest fairy type beings, some people who come from a more of a warrior background, they experience them as being uh, mischievous and cheeky and that they will steal your kids. People who come from a, a background that don't have any weapons, so through the Waitaha lineage, there's no recorded weapons in, in that aspect of my culture, they are family. They are treated as family. So that might indicate the, the degree of um, influence that our belief have on, on creating our experience of who they are. See, I, I, I'm very big on the fact that we are multidimensional. We are co-creators of our reality. So if we are holding fear and if we are resonating with that frequency, and then we are going out and doing a spiritual practice and inviting contact with whoever comes in. Guess what's going to come up? You know, because we have that frequency resonating in us and we have to, we're going to be met with something that corresponds with that, that's resonating with it. If we are in the spectrum of love and those energies, those frequencies, which are completely different, you know, it, it doesn't take much research to look at the structure of of, of those frequencies, you know, Masari Moto's work and so forth. Uh, and, and you can notice the difference. So, so there's an interfacing that goes with that, which is completely different. So the question really is, what are we creating? And who are we choosing to resonate with? Of course, the universe is full of life. Of course. What did Nassim say in the interview that he did with you guys? There's 40 billion planets alone in our galaxy, something like that. So it's full of life. There's no doubt a whole spectrum of consciousness out there and quite likely other beings like us that are violent that are on their planet. Personally, and this is my own belief, I don't believe they are allowed to leave their planet until they have graduated, until they have achieved peace and until they've demonstrated they're worthy of going and interacting with other species within their solar system or their, their local space time. Um, you, you know, and that makes complete sense when you look at the fact that us as human beings, we we have, you know, the United Nations, although they're, they're not, in my feelings, they're not the most representative um, organisation of our planet. At least there's a structure there that, that that is in place to kind of provide some kind of governance, if you like, for the planet. Imagine what a species that is a thousand or a hundred thousand years more advanced than us has in terms of governance. And how do they function? You know, and how does how does actually the technology to go from this point in space through entanglement to this point in space here, how does that work? Do you have to be at one 
with both parts of the universe to be present from that point to that point? Or can you go in a state of division from that point to that point and with a negative intent to eradicate an entire civilization? Is that how the universe works or is the universe a unified field? So these, these points, I think, need, require a lot more discussion for people that are holding um, fear and, and negative beliefs and to really look at the evidence of what's going on. I, in my experience, and I know, um, you know through working with Dr. Greer, there has been no, no negative experiences in the CE5 context since 1991 when it first started. Um, it, it's not to say that um, there aren't other influences there. So people might come across, let's say, a, uh, you know, and I've had this myself, where, where the, the, the defining, the, the difference is, you know you're dealing with a human component because it feels human. You know, extraterrestrial intelligence, when it's on the ground and when it's with you, it's, it's wildly different wildly different uh, the, the energy field and the, the states of of joy and love that you experience when they're around are just so incredibly different from us that it, it stands out as miles apart yet when there might be let's say what we were talking about before a, 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 a person who has passed away but is still kind of partly in this reality that needs to shift and they're trying to cling on because we've opened up to inviting whoever and they need to be moved through. It's about understanding that what we're experiencing um, might be that, you know. So I, I'm not claiming to have answers, and I would never profess that. But I just think, you know, we're really, you know, the, like the, the the Vedas say, one of the oldest and and most and one of the strongest sayings I've ever come across in terms of spirituality and development: "You are what you see." You know, uh, try it on. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, you look in the mirror. You are what you see. So what are we creating? What yeah, are we resonating yeah. with? Yeah. You know? Yeah, that so, is interesting. I mean, I've, I flip flop back and forth all the time, but I mean, you feel like the, that your perception or, or your, uh, your intention and your, and your perception of that is, is enough, right? I mean, it's, it's going to create your reality. Yeah. 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 I mean, it, of course, the life, the, the universe is full of life. There's there's many, many, many possibilities out there. Uh, but yeah, there's there's no direct evidence right now that says any of this contact is, is negative. Yeah, that's a good you point. Know, yeah. fact, in fact, I, I think the majority of it's actually really supportive. Yeah, yeah. You know, especially like what we regularly experience here with with these trifield meters is just um, is is huge amounts of electromagnetic energy flow. And it comes up in the context of wanting our planet to be healed, wanting us to live in a state of peace. You know, and that's often when the technology is really, really active, is when we're doing things that are aligned with the, uh, the benefit of our planet. You know, that's really when they're communicating. And another, another point I wanted to men mention as well is that, you know, contact doesn't really happen when people are in a state of fear or, or disharmony or division. So let's say you've got a group of 10 people. A couple of them have had an argument just prior to going out to do the field work. A couple of the people are feeling like it's not real and like um, a little scared. There will be a certain degree of contact and it will probably just be sky-based. Great. But close proximity contact, it only happens when the team is really coherent, when they're in a state of peace, when they're in... Uh, when they're in a loving field of energy, that's the only time it happens. Mm. And these, these beings just appear because we're matching their frequency. You know, Dr. Joe Dispenza, um, he, he recently spoke about this, and I was really amazed, and I really thank him for, for speaking about this because the language he used and the experience that he described in talking about working with light beings and that they just show up at his when he's doing healings for people, you know, that, that 
that to me, I, I was kind of blown away when I watched this interview because yeah. he's describing exactly the same thing that we, we experience. He's using the same language. He's talking about it in the same way. He's talking about frequency. When we uplift into that frequency, they are just there. Yeah. And guess what? They're helping us out because we're lifting up into their space. You know. So, yeah. so again, that, that speaks volumes to me, the fact that that's how contact occurs in terms of close proximity. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's hard for some people because, you know, we're, we're under the thumb of, uh, you know, now it's like, you know, big tech censorship and the military industrial complex and big pharma and and the ETs mm -hmm. have apparently been visiting these organizations. And they're like, why? Why won't they intervene then if they want us? Like, why is it up to us? You know, the, the to be uh, to reach this one percent so that we can flip the flip the tide you know and and because you not, want to appreciate i don't i don't mean that it's like why is it up to us but it just feels like i don't know i don't know i, I have a hard we time we don't do it our, if we don't do it ourselves we'll just we'll just squander it yeah we won't appreciate it yeah yeah, yeah. I, agree, I agree with it that it does yeah. feel like a law of the universe in a way it, it does make sense yeah. i mean he's you guys show in that documentary or that movie that you know the helium thing and the one percent and that's that's pretty interesting yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I do believe that that, that is very much a, a, well, potentially a, a universal law where, you know, you can't, you can't teach someone. You can only inspire them to learn for themselves. Yeah. And if you tell someone how to do it, they don't learn how to do it. Yeah, and it kind of makes know, sense so, that they can't come, they can't really intervene until we're ready. And maybe that ready, maybe being ready is only 1% at whatever. Maybe there's different uh, aspects of the people. I mean, maybe it's not all CE5, but it could be all these other people like Joe Dispenza doing whatever remote healings or Reiki or maybe it, it can be encompassing all these kind of spiritual aspects. Yeah. Yeah. I don't make much distinction between the methodologies, you know, because they're at the end of the day, they're all about coherence. They're all about heart centered awareness and they're all about peace. So the, the intent behind whatever modality is, is very much the same right now. Yeah. You know, in my in my experience. So whether you call it human initiated contact, whether you're following the Rama protocol, the C5 protocol, these are just terms. Yeah. The process itself is very similar. So, you know, whatever people want to do, as long as people are, are doing something right now that is of benefit for our planet and benefit for, for our species, then you're doing something and, yeah. you, and you're living. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. That might be just, you know, helping out one of your neighbors mow the lawn or something because they're a little bit, you know, under the weather. But that, that, that increases our, it just, it's just nice. It's just, it yeah. works. That's, that's what we are really, essentially. So yeah, it's, um, it's time to get on with the program. Have you been, have you been incorporating uh, Monroe Institute stuff for a while or are you just starting that, uh, like, like using that kind of OBE technology if, you know, to, to help with the contact? Yeah. But where I'm, geared towards now with this project that I've just I've just confirmed it this week actually. It's I've got a I've got a nap designer who's come on board who's a genius. Um, so we we're forming a collaboration and tomorrow night I'll be seeing a friend of mine who's um, very skilled with, with marketing. So yeah the idea is that uh, we're looking at the ambassador aspect of out of body exploration. So you know we know that a lot of these types of consciousness are not physical. And, you know, we know that it's of enormous benefit to humanity for us to learn of our multidimensional nature, you know, and to extend beyond the physical and to learn what we're actually capable of. Everybody has the ability to, to remote view. Everybody has the ability to be telepathic. You know, everybody has these these whether they believe it or not, you know, if you if you give it a go and you put it into practice, you know, you, you learn to ride the bike. You know what I mean? So that's where it's kind of geared towards is, is really empowering ourselves in our true nature, you know. We are not the spacesuit, so we've got to go beyond that. Mm -hmm. And we've got, to, we've got to really get into what the cosmos is, which is consciousness, you know, and... and explore that as our true reality and our true nature within the unified field so that that's yeah where, where we're really headed with it and with the intention of meeting other types of consciousness when out of body so hi i i've just popped into into your energy environment um at this specific frequency i'm a representative of earth 
and I, I would love to get to know you. Um, and then having that as a, you know, with controlled remote viewing, you have certain parameters in place so that the information is verified. Like I said earlier with the experience with my friend in Kansas, that's a control mechanism. So we know that we're dealing with information. It's not just a singular perspective and a singular experience. You come back, you talk about it, and it's very, very true to the individual, but how do you know that it is actually a truth? You know, so when we've got people that are, you know, going to the same parameters and experiencing the same information, then that then we're, that's the control mechanism of it, and that's where we confirm what we're experiencing. So, so will this app connect groups around the world at the similar time frames and stuff well, like that? Or? It's very much at the genesis stage right now. So it's going to be, you know, over the next six months or so, uh, we'll be developing it. Yeah, so what if I've, you could get people I've, listening to the same meditation in all different parts of the world and exactly you know, at the and same with time. the same yeah. with this like let's say there's teams of people that are all noticing a lot of activity around the Orion constellation, a lot of flashing. So there's a team of people that all decide to go out of body at the same time to go to the Orion constellation and then report back what they experience. Yeah, yeah. I find that I find that to be a very fascinating process and you know, really an exploration and consciousness. And this is, this is what I'm really motivated to do. Yeah. yeah. That would be fantastic if you could log those experiences, you know, indiv yeah. individually and then publish them all together so that people can't see it. It's not like a chat room, but it's like, Hey, you know, mm -hmm. we're seeing activity here. Let's, let's go there and then report it all back. And then later on at whatever time, you know, you can read everybody's experiences all, all at once that haven't yet. Yeah talk to those other people yeah that'd yeah. be really interesting and and decide for yourself based yeah. on the information yeah. if it doesn't float your boat it doesn't float your boat no yeah. problem yeah. you know there's no there's no harm in disagreement you know yeah <laughs> only the only harm that comes through disagreement is division you yeah. know but if we're learning from each other then that's a wonderful thing yeah is there anywhere anywhere our listeners can sort of follow you on social media or sort of keep an eye on the app so they can get it as yeah. soon as it's ready it, our website in New Zealand is ce5.nz, so really simple URL, just ce5.nz. Uh, so there is a there is an OBE page there, so that will contain the information. I do suggest to people to subscribe to the newsletter if they want to stay up to date with the progress, but it's very much, like I said, very much in the genesis stage of it at the moment. It, it, we've just kind of started this week, um, and I, I have recorded three of the files I aim to have about between nine and 11 files that people can use uh, for, for their own purpose um, in developing their own consciousness, you know, and, and experimenting with, with how we communicate non-locally. Yeah. yeah, that's great. Yeah, you'll have to keep us in, in the loop and let us know when that comes out too. Maybe we can have you back on for a quick segment or something. And uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that'd be fantastic. Yeah. yeah. And, and to the listeners that, you know, um, haven't tried CE5 before or haven't tried, you know, human-initiated contact, I, I would really encourage everyone to, you know, if they haven't watched the film, watch the film. It's available at seriousdisclosure.com. And also get the, get the uh, CE5 app. It's, it's a great resource. It's a really great resource. And you'll be surprised what happens. You know, it's, it's very easy to initiate contact. It really is. And that's often what people get blown away by, you know, you, you just follow some basic protocols, open up your heart, extend your, your energy field out to, to the universe and, and there's responses that come through. Yeah. And I, I feel that at this point in time that, you know, this is one of the most important things we could be doing as a species right now, you know, is greeting other civilizations. Whole other civilizations are coming here and are interacting with us and communicating with us. I mean, how fascinating is that, you know, to be here and and alive and able to do that yeah. it's like wow yeah. you know what i mean yeah it's such an incredible time for our species yeah it really is yeah yeah that's great In more ways than one yeah this has been a really yeah. fun this has been a really fun <laughs> chat it's been it's been i i i agree with you i think it's a good idea Grounds back on C five. He's been off for a I'm while. Take you out. He got scared. I'm take you out. Don't touch me. <laughs> <laughs> no touching. No, I'll go out. I'll go out. No guns, I'm hug? assuming. No, no guns. No, you can, don't bring your guns. All right. No. Handshakes are okay. Yeah, Handshakes, hugs. I'm okay with some hugs. <laughs> I'm down. Bring it. 
Bring your Taurus. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't have a Taurus. I have a Dodge. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks a lot. It. It's been a great chat. Really, uh, really yeah, fun meeting yeah. you. Yeah. Thanks for your time. Uh, really, yeah. really lovely chat with you both. Yeah, yeah I'll put, I'll put all you. those. Uh, I'll put all those websites in the show notes for you, and we'll uh, we'll point our listeners there. And honestly, that Close Encounters of the Fifth Kind is was a fantastic movie. Mm-hmm. You did a great job in there, and uh, yeah, congratulations. Thank you. Yeah. That's yeah. Good. Enjoy yeah. the future. Definitely. <laughs> let's let's make the future uh, the reality we want it to be. Right? Excellent. You bet. Right on. Awesome. Thanks, Jeremy. Thanks, buddy. Enjoy the rest of your Cheers, day. Cheers, guys. Okay, see ya. You too. Bye-bye. And that was Ooh. our chat with the one and only Jeremy Cloak. What'd you think, Ooh. buddy? Wow, it was awesome. I didn't know what to, what it was going to be like. It was fantastic. I'm pumped to bring you out this summer. Let's do it. To bring that's, me in? Yeah, let's have a... You guys can smoke your weed. We'll have a separate little... You and Jason can come out. Maybe we'll bring Brady and his brother, some other friends, and maybe our girlfriends even, and we can do like... We'll Jason? do like a private... We'll do like a... You know, won't open it up to the whole C5 community, but you guys can do your thing. All right. We'll go out. We'll just go out, find a great spot under the stars, and we'll do it. We camp. Sure, if you want to camp. Yeah, but let's do it. All right. I'm in. Let me know let's when it's it. warm again. It's a little cold. It's a little, a little cold, cold for hey, camping. Even on a thirty degree day in I know. here, it it's gets Alberta. cold at night. It gets it's cold ridiculous. as a motherfucker. Yeah. yeah. Legit cold. Yeah. yeah. But when you yeah. leave that and you like go back to Ontario and it's like thirty degrees at night, yeah. you're like, I miss Alberta. No, I like <laughs> that. I like the hot night. So you're trying yeah. to sleep. Yeah. Then what if you want to fuck? Yeah. You're all hot and sweaty already. Jeez. I mean, I bet you get pretty sweaty too. <laughs> <laughs> Vancouver Graham. <laughs> so another week, I you like, get a haircut. I like this stuff. I like this. Uh, I like that was a fun like C five one. Jeremy was a fun chat. I kind of, I kind of, I kind of resonate with that. It's like all about your intention and all about that. You know, you don't have to worry about. But I was gonna have Greer back on, and, huh? and, and you didn't want it. I, we don't need to. No, nah, I, I agree. Don't know. I don't know. I just. I like. I'd rather chat with a guy like this. I agree. Maybe we could have Terry Tabando back on. That would be fantastic. Yeah, let's do that. That's been years. <laughs> T Rod, it's been three, four years since we had him on. Big thanks to Jeremy for coming on the show. Maybe it's C five season where you are. You know, it's easier to sneak out of your house arrest at night. So maybe you're someplace that's on lockdown. You sneak out at night, scurry out of town to the edge of the edge of the light pollution, avoiding <laughs> yeah, exactly, detection exactly. from the fascists. Try and get out of and the, just the, watch the some flight stars. paths. Yeah. There's no flight pass right <laughs> there's no flight pass right now, so it's a bonus. We're back to the point where I notice planes, planes again because yeah. they're few and far yeah, between. And big thanks to Jeremy for coming on the show. Big thanks to you guys for listening. Uh we couldn't do it without you guys. We love you. It'd be no fun doing the show if no one was listening. We'd probably just stop doing it if no one was listening. And we might just keep doing it. But we wouldn't be able to afford to keep doing it if it wasn't for the supporters. I mean, um, we've got quite a few expenses over here. We're try- always trying to grow and do new things. We can't do that without our supporters. You guys are the best. We love you. Go to america.ca slash support if you want to become one of those lovely motherfuckers. Best people in the world, in my opinion. You log on, sign in, buck a month, two bucks a month, three bucks a month. I don't know. You decide. It's all the same. We don't... Uh, we don't value our supporters based on the amount they support. Just the fact that they support is enough. Of course, if you don't have any money, we understand that too. Uh, just check out the show notes. There's like a half a dozen ways to support the show that don't cost you a cent. You can review the show, sign up for the newsletter, share the show, buy some swag, tell your friends to buy some swag. Uh, there's a bunch of stuff there. Grammarica.ca slash support. Check out the show notes for other ways. You get all that black budget content as soon as you do that. A couple audio books in there. There's a ton more value. I mean, if you're not getting enough value from the show already, there's a ton more value in the black budget. And, of course, we're giving that out for free these days if you're uh, f- uh, financially under the weather from the COVID. Then let us know, and we'll send you another couple hundred hours of uh, entertainment. For America.ca slash support, if you can. We love you. Thanks for listening. And we will see you next week. Thanks. Did Robert Bonomo message us? That's weird, eh? Who is Robert Bonomo again? Cactus Land. Yeah, I see the link, but what what did we talk to him about? 
And it's the same picture picture as Jerry has. Yeah. Hi. Yes. Ready? Yes. August 2018. Huh. Hi, guys. What's up? Just published this piece on the COVID-19, and I thought you guys might like it. Okay, we got to get uh, going here. This is going to be... Maybe interesting. A quick start. Another one. What's this one on? Agri-Gris. Yeah. Okay, guys, we're gonna get out of here. We're gonna. We'll be, back. we'll be back in like fifteen minutes with another live show. Tell your friends.